Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started just since to keep everything on track here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll give people a little bit more time to kind of join here, but let's see how many do we have on track? We have a little over, is it 24 people joined so far? Okay. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you all for joining. We're, we're really excited to host this webinar tonight. Uh, my name is Josh Romero. I'm, I'm one of the PM&R PGY3 uh, residents at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm this year's 2022 AMSSM Sports Medicine Resident Council President. And I speak on behalf of both the Sports Resident, Resident Council as well as the Medical Student Interest Group and in saying welcome. And we're really excited to have you all here with us tonight. So tonight's going to be an Ask a Resident webinar, and it's going to be a question and, and answer format. Now, we, we really want this to be an informal session. And we're really hopeful that this provides a lot of helpful information for you all that joined. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and introduce the, the panel of speakers. So can, can each one, from, everybody from the SMRC as well as Jess, go ahead and introduce themselves. And we can go ahead and start with Jess since you're through the top of my screen here. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, so I'm a rising fourth year. Um, I'm at Central Michigan University. Um, and I'm the MSIG president for this year. So um, we're really looking forward to meeting you guys and getting you more involved in sports medicine and kind of um, tailoring this year to your needs. So very receptive to feedback and um, just hearing from medical students because we really want to get you guys involved in AMSSM, um, you know, early on so that when you're a resident, you can hit the ground running. So great to see you guys out. And Mohammed, you want to go next? Okay. My name is Mohammed. It's nice to meet you guys. Uh, I'm also a Michigander. Uh, I went to Michigan State, the osteopathic college, so I'm a proud DO. Big Spartan fan. Uh, I love like I love football. I love soccer. Uh, I am obsessed with like UFC. Probably one of the few out there. <laughs> so uh, just like just said, uh, I think being part of that you know, AMSSM as a medical student is, is just amazing. You guys will have such a good experience and hopefully we can, uh, we can share that experience and make it the best possible. Anna. Hey everyone. My name is Anna uh, Bueller. I'm um, an internal medicine uh, resident on the SMRC. I am from San Diego, but I am at the university of Colorado Colorado right now for my residency program. I'm a second year, soon to be a third year. Um, and yeah, excited to be here. Great. Uh, Raven? Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Raven Patel. I'm a second year family medicine resident, about to be a three at Inspira Health Network in South Jersey. And I'm the family medicine res representative for um, the SMRC and excited to be here tonight. Okay, Justin. As I'm Justin Chu, I am a third year uh, internal medicine and pediatrics resident at the University of Louisville. I'm the pediatrics representative though for the SMRC. And yeah, excited for a good night, let's rock and roll. Carol. Hey guys, I'm Carol. I'm the, I'm a PGY3. PM&R resident at Rush in Chicago, and I'm the PM&R representative, and I am excited to be here too. Hi. Hi, my name is Kai Ten. I'm a PGY1 in Doctors Ohio, um, Doctors Hospital in Ohio. I'm an emergency medicine um, intern, so I'm an EM representative on the SMRC. Nice to meet you all. And Gio. Hey all, my name is Gio. Um, I'm a PGY4 at Emory University. Uh, I've successfully matched to where Josh is at, at Mayo Clinic for sports medicine. Um, I was the prior SMRC president 
uh, in 2021 and then the prior communication representative in 2020. So I'm um, very excited. I'm currently right now going to be the uh, fellowship representative um, for the fellowship class. So really, really excited to get the learners out there, the medical students on board on what is, you know, the route to journey of sports medicine. Um, because if you are certainly even thinking about pursuing such a a fantastic specialty. This is such an amazing resource and get a great organization to get involved in as early as a medical student. Great. And then Joan, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Hi, I'm Joan Brown and I'm the AMSSM membership manager. Um, and uh, love serving um, all of the AMSS members and so glad that the residents and students are doing this collaborative effort tonight. Great, thank you all for, for introducing yourselves, really appreciate that. So as I mentioned at the beginning, really this is gonna be a question and answer format. So we really want this to be as informal as possible. Now, with that being said, we've broken this up into two segments. The first segment is going to be an overview of common questions that medical students have frequently asked us, as well as questions that have been posed to, the, to MSIG members. And during that time, the panel is going to be all of the people you just heard from. The second segment is going to be a breakout sessions. And during that, we're going to be breaking off into each primary specialty. So each specialty that's been represented here, we're going to break off and have an additional panel uh, with, with more members representing each primary specialty. Now on that note, if you can all please who are attending right now, please in the chat, place your full name as well as the primary specialty that you want to attend during the breakout session. And know that you can attend more than one. So uh, you, you're not, um, you don't only have to attend the one that you choose initially, but we wanna make sure that we can have everybody assigned to a breakout room once we go to that segment. So if you can please place it on the chat now, it'd be helpful for us. So what, what are the, what's the goal of, of tonight? So really we, it's, it's threefold. So really we want you to feel more confident about the upcoming residency applications. We want you to learn about resources that are available by the AMSSM for medical student members. And I also want you to connect with fellow peers interested in sports medicine, but really overarchingly, we really want you just to have fun and hopefully learn something new tonight. So just to go through a brief overview. So the road to residency. So, so a lot of common question that people ask is, well, how, how can I, I match well in, in, in the residency of my choice? Well, it's gonna come as no surprise that really it just comes down to trying to do as well as, as you can in medical school. And, and what does that mean? Well. Really, it's, it's about focusing on each step in the process. So really trying to do as well as you can in the preclinical years, as well as in the clinical years. And I think part of what, what doing well is really trying to develop good habits because a good fellow, a good resident, all come from being a good medical student. So with each step, you wanna build upon uh, solid foundational principles. So that's, that's, that's really helpful as you kind of go through this stage and then each stage thereafter. Now also medical school, I mean, you, everyone that, that's attending this session or who's gonna watch this session later on, you're, you're already kind of ahead of the game. And so beyond that, it's really helpful to make contacts in sports medicine. So this can come in the form as um, through national organizations such as the AMSSM or ACSM, can also come in the form of primary specialty organizations. So for example, for PMNR, AAPMNR, family medicine, AAFP, um, and so on and so forth. Connecting with local sports medicine physicians is also very helpful. So connecting, whether that be at your local institution or within your local city, it's also help, those are helpful resources for you. Also talking with local fellows and residents. So at most institutions, there's, there's, a, there's a plethora of, of residents and really it's, it's, it's helpful to really kind of pick their brain and why they chose the route they did. And then finally, if, there, if your medical school has a student interest group related to sports medicine, it's really helpful to, to attend those sessions or become as involved and or even lead uh, that group uh, in the future. Now, really what we'd all encourage you to do is really explore the various primary specialties for sports medicine. As we talked about at the beginning, there's, there's, there's multiple routes to sports medicine. And so really uh, exploring these various routes and assigning the one that you really, that, that best fits you is really important. 
So give you just a brief conceptual overview. So sports medicine as a whole is a very large field. Now, if we break it up, we have non-operative and then operative. So the, the operative portion is going to be reserved for orthopedic surgery. And then the non-operative, or, or really more formally known as the primary care sports medicine, which we'll be talking about tonight, has these various options that are available. So you can go into primary care sports medicine. Uh, the most common route is via family medicine. We can go in via physical medicine rehab emergency medicine, internal medicine, or pediatrics. And I believe there are, there are, it's, it's quite small, but even neurology can go through, through um, go into some programs as well. But I know that that's fairly uncommon, but it, it is an option. So the AMSSM is, 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 has a, a plethora of resources, and these are all very helpful. So first of all, I really encourage you all to become student members of the AMSSM. I believe it's a one-time fee of $30 to join. Now, the AMSSM really offers a lot of resources. So the MSIG, as we talked about at the beginning, that's a really helpful, that, that organization to be very helpful in pushing more webinars forward, as well as providing more resources for medical students. And then there's all these, I just provided a sample here, but there's really a lot of resources available for medical students on the AMSSM website. So let's, let's get into some more specific, what are, um, particularly for those applying for residency in this, this upcoming cycle. So I'll pose this to the group. And it comes to personal statements in, in ERAS. So the common question is, how long should a personal statement be? And anybody on the panel who wants to kind of chip in here, please, please, please feel free to do so. I think definitely um, for length of personal statement, one page is what I usually tell medical students to have. I say that a bad personal statement can definitely hurt you, but a good personal statement may not like help, but it may just be one of the check marks that some programs look at. I know some programs, like our program really looks really heavily on that personal statement. I've been to other programs that are, it's like, it's just a checklist. Um, I would do something, I would make your personal statement something that's unique to yourself. I wouldn't try to go off cookie cutter templates and just try to list off your CV. I think that's one of the biggest things that it's hard not to do, just re rewrite your CV. In um, I would focus on things that, and it, I would use the personal statement to address things that you want that residency program to know about you, what makes you unique, why you would be a good fit at their program that isn't listed on your CV, or if there's any gaps in your medical education, if there's things that you want to explain on your CV, you can use your uh, personal statement as that, um, as that medium. I think that last part Revan said was a, is a big deal. Uh, if you have like red flags, I mean, you would be shocked. You're not alone. There's so many people out there, uh, just like you, you know, but I would address it in the personal statement. Um, we all kind of go through the same path during this. And when we're reviewing applications or when we're talking to medical students that want to join the residency program, I think a big part of it is, okay, was it in the personal statement more so than uh, what was that red flag of theirs, which might not even be a red flag for a residency program. I would also just add like, in life or whenever if you're writing a personal statement, like you should always have at least a couple other people looking at it and helping you proofread. Um, like do not just write it and submit it without anyone else's input. Cause there's things that people will just comment on that. You, you know, you don't think it sounds odd, but they might, you know, bring up things that you wouldn't notice or grammar or whatever it is. So that's a good rule of thumb for all personal statements. Going off of that. If you have a spelling mistake in it, that's kind of a red flag because it just shows that you're not paying attention. You know, you don't have good attention to detail. So like Anna said, that's important to have someone read it. Um, another thing that I've heard from a lot of sports docs specifically is they don't care about the time you tore your ACL. And yet, it's so common, especially in sports, to have this injury, you did rehab, and then now you want to be a sports doc. If there's something interesting and um, different about your story, it, it's still good to write in there and talk about your motivation. But if it's just that generic story, it's actually not that interesting because most people going into sports probably have something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, 
a lot of things have been brought up that's really strong. Um, I do also agree that you should have multiple people read your personal statement. And like Anna kind of said too, if someone could have like some type of English or like writing background, that's really helpful. So you're not missing any like simple things like grammatic or subject verb agreement, stuff like that. Um, and like, it's already kind of been harped on too. Like it really is, um, it's just another opportunity for you to kind of share things that you can put in a different way um, and be more unique than you can just list in your CV, but just don't obviously rewrite that like they've already said too. Um, and like, like they've already kind of elaborated. It's more likely going to, it's easier to be just like a regular piece of hay in the haystack as opposed to like that. There's very little, very few amazingly well-written personal statements. You're likely just going to be like this one, another one in all these program directors read like hundreds of, of personal statements. So as long as you don't stand out in a bad way, it probably won't hurt you, but is that opportunity for you to kind of share um, a little bit more by yourself in a more personal and unique, unique way. Um, so the more unique you can be in a positive, that was really good. Um, but yeah. I'm going to give my two cents. Um, the personal statement, just breaking it down uh, for medical students, focusing on going into the residency, do not make it 100% sports related because that is very, very key, especially me being, I was ch being chief resident for this year for this residency program and reviewing all the personal statements for upcoming, for incoming medical students. The best thing, best sort of advice I can give is to give the reasoning why you want to go into that specialty and understand the, like, you, that you can have certain experiences in that residency. For example, way rotations and gather from like particular cases and incorporate it into your personal statement. It works really, really well. Um, the second portion of going into your career and going into fellowship, that's when you're honing in on sports medicine 100%. And that was my favorite part especially um, when I underwent the application cycle. So it really is trying to not vomit your resume or your CV because that's a, that's a very common mistake to have. And the multiple program directors have said, I already have your CV on ERAS. Why would I want to look, read it a second time? You just made me waste my time. <laughs> so essentially it's more like what is not on your CV. I mean, clearly you can put some things on your CV that makes you unique but utilize that platform as a personal taste and something, a personal taste that will be memorable, that will be something in particular that you can discuss during the interview trail because multiple times I have gotten um, in during the interviews and saying, hey, I read this your personal statement. That's very unique. That like, tell me more about this hobby of yours that you incorporated into for sports medicine or your, into your education during your residency education. I would say that's the best approach other than kind of just like, you know, listing everything out there from your CV. Cause it, 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 you know, honestly, that's what I did in the beginning. And I'm like, and I gave it to friends. I gave it to family. I gave it to mentors and said, Hey, actually scratch that. And also scratch the idea of like, Oh, I had an ACL tear back when I was in college. And that's the reason why I got into sports medicine. That's, that's actually very, very, very common. Yeah, that was a very good discussion. I really don't have much to add to that. You know, as everyone mentioned, really, you you want to you only have so much space to kind of get your name out there, and so really optimizing the ability to use the CV and the personal statement. You want you want to use these as, um, as kind of separate entities, if you will, to really get as much information about yourself as possible. And so, and that's really been said. So I think that's a great discussion. I guess one thing I'll ask for the group too is. What about writing personal statements to specific programs in addition to a general personal statement? Any advice on that? Uh, I can chime in on that for, for particular programs. In particular for PM&R, there are spine, sports and spine programs. Um, and they sometimes cater to, for example, you know, floral experiences and all that stuff. I had, for that reason, had a personal statement for primarily primary care family medicine based sports programs and then primarily PM&R based sports medicine programs. And that worked really well for me. I enjoyed keeping it like one. Uh, so I'm in family medicine and I had one letter or one personal statement for all of family medicine. I can see. I guess the temptation to kind of want to 
put one for a specific program and it would probably be viewed as a positive, you know? Uh, so I guess you can kind of debate it. Uh, but I, I thought it worked out fine with just having one generic one. But the, I think the personal statement is more about you and why you want to become, like join that specialty. Uh, so that's my two cents. I would say if you have a very specific reason that you're interested in a program that maybe it isn't obvious in your application why you have ties there or a specific interest, you're likely better off sending a note to the program coordinator or the program director explaining why you're so interested in that program because they might not ever really look at your application if they don't have another reason to. Okay, great. Uh, we'll, we'll keep moving forward here. Thank you all for your input. So now one question that's been posed to is how to list sports medicine related experiences on and that and par primarily as it goes for ERAS for residency. I think you should, um, if you have a lot of sports medicine experiences, maybe it's stratifying them into if you did a bunch of races or a bunch of football games, like you don't have to list every single one as a separate activity. You could do either sideline coverage, did football at this high school from this state to this state and your role, whether um, you're with a fellow resident or one of the attendings, and then you could just do another one for race coverage. Or if you only have a few, you could just do sports medicine experience and make that one category. Cause I think most people in medical school, you have other things outside of sports medicine that you have, that you want to highlight on your US. So that's just one way to do it. Agreed. You can make it a volunteering experience under ERS. For folks that uh, want to get a little bit more specific on the sports coverage, I think one of the best advice that I got was to label which one was truly independent coverage versus which one was shadowing. Because during uh, the as a medical student, I mean, in my CV, in my medical student, I primarily did shadowing. And I say I was, shat I was shadowing this particular attending at this particular time frame, fall schedule, four home games, football games, and I have that. And also another piece of advice is to always have your – make a CV now if you haven't, just to kind of just always just put things in constantly. All the, all the sports covers that you have, you make a quick note of it and you have it there updated. But having that ability to say, I've had these amount of games as independent coverage is very nice for people who are reading your resume. And then they can say, okay, and this person has had, you know, has graduated into a nice sports mess, sports sideline coverage. Okay, just in the interest of time, I think we'll keep moving forward here. So um, signaling, this is new for this year. And I'll have Jess just quickly talk about this. Yeah, um, yeah, a couple people post questions about this, and I know this is, you know, for everyone that's about to apply, um, kind of a little bit anxiety provoking because there's really not a lot um, in a lot of programs. This is new this year. And so I could just briefly go through it. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that this past week, the AAMC uh, released a guide for um, the supplemental application and a webinar. So that's why we're just gonna really quickly um, do a quick overview of this, but that's like a very great resource um, and goes through just the rationale behind it. Um, but the biggest thing for this supplemental application um, that now EM, IM, PEDS, and PMNR are all going through this upcoming cycle is the uh, AAMC basically they stated um, it's advising programs to consider this data in context of the complete application to use the data as a plus factor rather than screening out applicants. So just keep that in mind um, when you're filling out the supplemental that it's really supposed to open up programs for the applicant. Um, and so with that in mind, um, EM is participating this year. They're going to get a five um, signals. And then there was advice on whether you need to signal your home institution or signal away ro rotations that you completed. And for EM, they've stated the consensus is no, you do not have to signal your home and no, you don't have to signal in a way. For IM, you have seven signals. Um, you do not have to signal your home and you do not have to signal in a way. 
And where it changes is in PEDS, there's five total signals. And so signals are basically you, um, I should have explained this to your signaling programs that are your top priorities. So um, you will send those out to, and you have a max of five. Um, you can signal your home institution and they do want you to signal away rotations in PEDS. And then in PM&R, um, there's a max of four signals to programs. Um, you need to signal your home institution and you need to signal away rotations. Um, and the thought is, is while attending that web webinar is that they really wanna know, are you interested in coming to our program? Have you, you know, done the research before submitting your application? And um, do you feel like they would be a really strong fit for you? So I really would encourage you guys to watch that web webinar and to look through the um, a AAMC guide for the supplemental application. Um, so outside of signaling to programs, what's new this year is also the geographic preferencing. Um, and that's, they have five geographic locations that across the country and you can signal three of them. And out of these specialties that we're talking about tonight, all of them are participating in the geographic except for emergency medicine. Um, so they're the only one that will not be. Um, but outside of that, again, just keep in mind that this isn't gonna, this data isn't meant to be used in their ranking of you. It's really supposed to open up potentially some interviews. And from the data of last year, um, they've looked into it and it, they're saying that most programs shared that geographic preferences and program signals helped them identify applicants they would have over otherwise overlooked. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, that, that's a great overview, so thanks. We'll keep moving forward just in the interest of time here. So um, they, the AMC also announced that they are advocating for virtual interviews for this year. And so just in the interest of time, maybe we can have maybe just one or two people speak on advice for virtual interviews and particularly those who have either uh, interviewed people and or interviewed themselves virtually. I'd say wear pants <laughs> or at least something down there because, you know, you'll never know. Uh, I had a, I heard a story where someone that they asked someone to stand up, but, you know, that never happened to me. And I had plenty of interviews. I've never asked that to medical. I mean, uh, you know, aspiring medical students or anything like that. But I think the lesson here is like, just be prepared, right? Like actually go to the website and go through like their, their website. If they ask you a question, uh, know about their institution, know about their program. Uh, just understand that the, although the interview is going to be about you, they're also kind of gauging your interest. Like how interested is this applicant and us. And that's something I think a lot of people look forward to because there's a lot of applicants, you know, and you, someone that knows their program, I think stands out. I would say that's one. And number two is know your CV. Um, if you're putting something in your application, just make sure you kind of read, read it over before the interview, because, you know, you'd be shocked at how quick uh, you forget exactly that research project you did in med school. <laughs> to, and then they're, they might ask you or your hobbies, like, Oh, I love bonfires. So they're going to ask you, like, tell me more about your bonfires. I think another thing as well for now that we've been interviewing people for two cycles is definitely, I know it's kind of awkward being on the Zoom thing, but you definitely have to speak up during these interviews. Um, a lot of people were great on paper, but the only time we talked to them was during that, what, that you know, 15 minute interview we had. We had open, uh, we had breakout rooms and like a pre-interview dinner before where we sent out like gift cards and stuff. And you could hang out and some people just stayed completely silent on that. I never think that's a good thing. I don't think you should be the person talking the most because we didn't like those people either, but just like, I would try to speak up and try to connect with one or two of the residents and kind of follow up with them afterwards because it's really tough um, being on the virtual thing and making yourself stand out. Uh, but I think if you can speak up and kind of answer questions and ask questions, I think residents really like that when you ask them about things that aren't on their website, ask them about what they like to do in their free time, what, what they like about the program, things that you can really look up and I feel like residents appreciate that and we'll kind of remember you for that. And good lighting, good lighting goes yeah. miles, miles. Like that's like basically a good suit on an interview if you have good lighting. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly, we'll, and we'll keep moving forward here shortly here, but yeah, just really think about, you know, certainly knowing your application um, and then being as personal as possible as you can virtually. I know that can be challenging, but really trying to just maximize that, that platform. But think about small things, so lighting, the quality of the camera, 
the quality of the microphone that you're using, all these things. And you know, we've, we've actually done a, a literature search on, there's been several things published on how to maximize yourself virtually. And we'll send that out and subsequently in the e-blast, but these are just some good tips to think about as you move forward. And, and there's some of these articles really outline specific tangible things to think about as you interview virtually this year. So, um, and then what are some things to, to prioritize in the rank list? So we all have some ideas of, of things we prioritize as a medical student, but as you start to look back now being in residency, what advice would you have for medical students in terms of prioritizing their rank list? Um, I can go ahead first on this one. I, I think one of the biggest things is for me has been mentorship. And so I think that what I mean by that is availability of mentors. Uh, there, and I think having mentors in multiple facets. So having a research mentor, a clinical mentor, somebody who's going to vouch for you just personally. Um, I think, all, I think there, you can have various types of mentors, but I think for me, mentorship and the culture of a program have really shaped how I view things. And so, you know, as a medical student, I don't know that I thought about those things as much as I do now as a resident. So as I go forward to fellowship, that's something I would be prioritizing very heavily because I think that those things have really significantly impacted my development as a resident. I think I'll quickly chime in here. For me, it was kind of like location, family, community. Uh, those things mattered a lot to me at the time because uh, I think you maximize yourself if you're comfortable in that in that sense, especially during residency. It's a long process. Uh, but that being said, I think you need to heavily weigh that with um, you know a good residency experience. I think those two, uh, fi find your scale and weigh those two and you'll have your answer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Go wherever you think you're going to be happy. There's great resi programs everywhere. You're going to get good training. You're going to see a lot of patients. You're going to learn a lot of things. Go where you'll be happy. It's all the other matters at the end of the day, among other things. But big. And one thing I'll say too is certainly the program you do to you go to does shape you to some degree. But by and large who you are as an individual and what you put into residency really is gonna be the biggest thing. And so I think the program is one factor, but really a lot of it is, is, is what you put into residency yourself. So you keep that in mind as you move forward that the program is one factor, but really you as an individual is probably the biggest factor, at least in my opinion. Um, and then we'll just, uh, just because we're running a little bit late here, we'll just keep moving forward. Now, and that's probably the last one we talked about. So some sports medicine specific questions. So number one, what primary specialty to choose? And I think that we can probably go through this a little bit more in the breakout sessions, but what are some, what are some ways to get involved in sports medicine during residency that, that each of us have had the opportunity to do so far? I think getting involved with AMSSM obviously is a huge one. They have amazing resources. It's a good network of people to connect with through social uh, we're really pushing that this year. And just honestly, what I did is just kind of get involved. If you don't have a primary uh, sports medicine fellowship at your program or orthopedics department, just reach around to the outside communities with private practice orthopedics and anyone else who's a sports medicine doctor. A lot of sports medicine doctors are super um, receptive to talking to you and just kind of giving you advice. And so meeting residents and fellows is super helpful in residency. Yeah, I, I think certainly just to echo, you know, certainly sports coverage, if that's an opportunity at your residency is very helpful. Um, and I think that, that that's great. And I think, again, to kind of getting in, plugged in with any mentors, any mentors, whether that's um, faculty who are fellowship trained in sports medicine or reaching out to, to local uh, prior practice physicians, too, if, if that's available in your, in your network. One thing I'll just, I'll, I think is important to talk about is, again, residency is your base specialty. And so really, you really want to balance your, your, passion for sports medicine with really trying to invest in your primary specialty. Again, as we talked about, we, we need to be good at each step of the process. So being a good medical student, being a good resident, all translate to being a good fellow, which then translate to being a good sports medicine physician. So we really want to, we want to embrace the process and lean into each step of that. And so you can, you can certainly be passionate about sports medicine, which I'm, I imagine all of us here are, but you really want to first be a good resident and then those will help build the foundation to being a good sports medicine physician. Now, one thing I want to put a plug in for, so we keep talking about, about AMSSM. So 
there's various platforms that we have available on social media to stay connected. So both the SMRC as well as MSIG, we have an Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages. And I really encourage you to follow these. We'll be highlighting uh, various webinars as well as other resources on, on these social media platforms. Now we're gonna go ahead and go to the breakout rooms. And if you haven't already, please put your name and the specialty that you'd like to go, the breakout room that you'd like to go into in the chat now. And we'll transition to the breakout rooms. Once we go to the breakout rooms, we won't come back to a, to a large group setting uh, again. So that will end in the breakout rooms. Now, again, if you'd like to go transition from a specific breakout room to another, come back to the main room and then we'll have somebody available in the main room that can transfer you to the, the new breakout room. Again, thank you all for your time and attention this evening and, and we'll make the transition to the breakout rooms now. Hey, uh, so I'm gonna make an announcement um, for the transfer of the breakout rooms. Uh, we're gonna be doing that to individual Zoom links. Uh, Joan has copied and pasted it and we're doing that because we would like to record it and we can't record multiple breakout rooms in the, in the same time. So I also pasted all the multiple Zoom links. If you'd like, I think if you're interested in going to multiple uh, breakout rooms, please just copy the whole entire comment and then have it pasted so then you can just kind of uh, click on the links to go to individual rooms, okay? This room in itself, correct me if I'm wrong, Joan, is gonna be family medicine room? That's correct. All right, so this room in itself is gonna be the family medicine room, um, and then we can just kind of go in our separate rooms. Okay, all right, everybody, we'll see you in the next breakout room. <laughs>